today we will be going over the history of the Zodiac Seawolf and Super Seawolf. Let's start at the beginning. The Seawolf was first released in 1953. It is believed that the earliest models were water resistant to only 10 atmospheres, unlike the later versions which were 20. Radium paint was used on the hands and dial. Since the luminous paint had a tendency to crack, newer versions had a spine dividing the hands in half. Eventually, the radium was phased out and tritium replaced it. In 1959, the U.S. Experimental Diving Unit tested the Seawolf along with a Blancpas 50 Fathoms, Submariner, and a Car Sherpa and Bulova prototype. The Zodiac was deemed a failure due to its poor anti-magnetic characteristics, shiny finish, and insecure bezel. The 50 Fathoms won out. These two models will be reunited again later in our story. Here is a shot of the first generation plated metal bezel and the second generation skeletonized hands. I believe that sometime in the late 60s, Zodiac started using acrylic bezels and more colors on their sea wolves. This orange one is particularly rare. It goes without saying that spares are hard to come by. Movement-wise, I'm unsure of the earliest models. Later models used the Adolf Schild 1688-derived calibers 70, 72, 76, and 86. The versions with a date wheel tend to develop problems with the offset cannon pinion. As such, it's best not to adjust the date on these watches. Ironically enough, somewhere in the late 60s or early 70s, both Zodiac and Blancpas started using the very same EPSA single crown super compressor case along with many other brands such as DLC. There were multiple versions made by Zodiac, some with a red day date and others with only a date. Some had quadrant decompression dials and others did not. The acrylic bezel had to be pushed down so you could turn it. Movements were either Zodiac-modified Adolf Shields or ETAs. There was also a Valju 72 Seawolf chronograph. For what it's worth, ultra-vintage.com currently makes replacement crystals for this case type. A particularly strange version of the Super Seawolf was the so-called oblong coffin-shaped 2-crown 36,000 beat per hour SST. Incidentally, the SST stood for split-second timing. This high-beat caliber 86 movement was also derived from the Adolf Schild 1688 and is very sensitive to prolonged service intervals. Incidentally, the second crown controls the inner bezel in this model. Like many other Swiss brands in the late 70s, Zodiac was doing very poorly due to the popularity of Japanese quartz watches. In the early 80s, they were bought out by the Swiss Dixie Machine Company. Interestingly enough, they had also bought Zenith watches a few years prior and had planned to have Zenith make Zodiac watches. It is uncertain if this ever came to pass. Incidentally, Zenith also started making the El Primero again for Ebel, thanks to Charles Vermeau, who refused to get rid of the machinery for it when he was ordered to. Ironically enough, Dixie Machine was itself acquired by a Japanese company in 2007. That did make me chuckle. In 1990, former Tag Heuer finance director Willy Monier bought the Zodiac and started a number of different lines. Not surprisingly, given his background, a few resembled some older Tag Heuers. One bright spot was the fact that a new generation of the Super Seawolf was released. It is believed to have been designed by the same person who did the Tag Heuer Super Professional. It had an ETA 2824 and Sapphire Crystal. Unfortunately, the company still went bankrupt seven years later, in 1997. At that point, it was bought out by Genender International. The good news was that they continued to make the same Super Seawolf, now with a beefier bracelet and fluorescent dial and hand highlights. For what it's worth, I'll be reviewing this watch in a separate video, but for the purpose of this review, it only lasted for three years. One point I do want to bring up is the common misconception that this watch was used by the Navy SEALs. While the original Seawolf was popular with military personnel, especially during the Vietnam War, there is no evidence that this new version was as well. As you can see here, an ad implied its popularity by stating that it was the official watch of the Naval Special Warfare's UDT SEAL Association. The problem is that this organization is non-governmental. It's simply a non-profit veteran support organization. I guess ultimately it's no worse than the JLC Navy SEALs Beverly Hills edition. Anyway, in 2001, Genender sold Zodiac to Fossil for almost $5 million. And that's where my Seawolf story ends. That's about it for this video, and as usual, thanks for watching.